enjoy. Today on Breaking Chains, Becky will be sharing an update from the land of the Sahara. In our tour of Women at Risk in Africa, I know there's a program that is near and dear to your heart. Can you tell us a little bit about the program where um, our partners make cow horn and magazine jewelry products? Yes. So Africa is this incredible continent. And one of the countries that we've had programs in for quite some time is Uganda. And back in the day, a car literally drove into our parking lot years ago. This young woman opened the trunk of her car and there was all this magazine jewelry laying there that she wanted me to sell and when I picked it up it was black and the paint came off of my hands and I was like okay we're gonna have to do this you know differently but what I learned was the Ugandan women know how to roll magazine paper and so we started with them way back in the day just helping them learn how to have some quality control and so sometimes on these magazine beads you can actually see the hand the writing like newspaper writing or magazine writing and then they roll them and it is a lot harder than it looks they roll them on toothpicks and then they pull the toothpick out and then that allows for the bead to go through but this is really labor intense work and it's wonderful because because developing countries never ever throw anything away. There's no waste. And so they even use old paper and roll it. And they're just fun. They're lightweight. And today they make beautiful, beautiful products from this. And they've learned how to make some designs that are a little more um, interesting to picky Americans. And so these two are fun because they go with jeans nicely. But these, again, are little magazine bees. And I learned that the littler they are, the harder they are to make. And so you would think because they're littler, they'd be cheaper, but they're actually harder to make. And so today our um, widows, this is a program of all widows, and I love widows. So I grew up in a developing country in Asia, and one of the things I learned early as a little girl was to go with my mom to the villages where the widows were. And she was an artist, and she would draw stories on flashcards and I would hold the stories for her and um, these widows um, in these countries where they have no male protector and no income are seriously at risk and so there's always been a soft spot, spot in the heart of war family for widows and these are widows who are all HIV positive they're, um, because their husbands and their husbands are dead and so they're raising their children and when I first met these widows, they were living in these mud, like huts that were literally dung, dung and twigs held together. And today, because of the magazine jewelry, they have little tiny um, brick homes with a tin roof, and it's just so much fun. And so then they make other things, like this is gray, which is a very popular color, and these are earrings, same idea, and stretchy bracelet. So the magazine bead jewelry was fun, but then magazine beads started becoming more common in America, right? You could find them in a lot of places, and so their sales were not as robust. And so we started doing other things like we um, put cisterns. They have above the ground water cisterns because they have to walk down to the Nile where there's crocodiles and their elderly widows, some of them, and they had to carry all the water up by putting cisterns and connecting it to a system on the roof that collects rainwater. These were widows, Audrey, who were selling rainwater in baggies with a straw in it in the market as drinking water. And I was like, anybody who's gonna sell rainwater to feed her babies is my kind of girl. So then with the help of my husband's organization, we built a cow horn factory. Who would dream that cow horn would be, this is polished cow horn, and they do these fun things, like this is a can opener, mm -hmm. and my boys love this. This is a great <laughs> dad gift coming up for, th for Father's Day. But they, it starts out really, really, um, the cows uh, don't, aren't harmed by this. Mm -hmm. They act, their horns actually grow longer based on the heat because that's how they get rid of the heat in a hot 
climate and so they have enormously long cow horns and then when they butcher them for the market they were throwing the horns out but we um, get those and use them and so you can see intricate designs here of Africa and they polish this this little votive here when you put a, a light in it this is a little candle it just glows and it looks like mother of pearl it's amazing process to see how they do that and so little by little we just start giving them more and more things that they could make and then the last time I was there we were there on a medical clinic and I met Faith this adorable little widow we did a medical clinic and she came she's four foot tall she's one of the original widows she's completely bent over at the waist um, because of osteoporosis mm -hmm. and so I had to sit on the floor and look up at her face to talk to her and we held a banquet for them like we love to do in the war family and in African culture there was African worship the oldest women start the worship and she was out there doing African worship dance bent over for four hours and people were just stunned some of the people from the hotel were standing around going why would these people be so joyful when they're so poor and it was just such a beautiful sight and it was just so much fun and then I found this in the market in Uganda and I'm always looking for products so we also have a safe house there they don't make product but they um, rescue women and so we've helped repatriate women who have been trafficked from Uganda to Asia and our partners there rescue the women and send them we repatriate them back to Uganda and that safe house there picks them up and helps them get jobs and heal and wrap around services and we did a clinic there too so I went into the marketplace and I never know what I'm gonna find because I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> but I found this adorable mobile and it's just a market piece and I'm, I'll tell, tell you in another breaking chains more about how we do market pieces but I just told the widows you don't sew yet so let me see if this sells but look at that adorable little lion and that giraffe and these are all made out of tribal fabrics and uh, we just had to experiment with it to see if it would even sell but they can look at those fabrics and know which tribe it is just like you would look at a Scottish plaid and know what tribe it's from and so it's just fun to use some of their stuff that was um, already there when we put the cisterns in we taught them how to do drip irrigation mm -hmm. and we taught them how to do um, little gardens in their you know produce in their garden and so they were able to start growing products that they could sell in the market as food and it's so exciting I just recently got an email from the widows and they were um, telling us women at risk that they're praying for us yeah. because they know they are used to chaos they are used to disease and disaster and they said in there thank you for what you've done for us because even though they can't go to the factory mm -hmm. and make um, our cow horn right now they're at home they have running water they have gardens we gave them goats and they have a goat program and and they have chickens and they can you know milk the goats and have milk and so they just wanted us to know that thanks to the programs the wraparound services that we've done that they are able to survive and at that banquet two young people came up to me one young man and he said my mother's one of the widows and today I'm a lawyer and a girl came up to me with her mom and showed me her graduation picture and she said today I'm a banker and she started to cry and she said if it weren't for women at risk and all of our constituency who make it possible she said I'd be in the street today and so it's just it's a wonderful thing to be able to um, help lift them to worth and dignity and just share with them so those are some of the fun African products products from that part absolutely be sure to stay tuned for a future update on how we beta test our market items a common question we hear from events is what we do to protect children.
Can you share with us some examples of how War Cares for Kiddos? Well, obviously, um, we're all moms and dads and sisters and aunts and kids are so precious and so much fun and there's a reason why um, they bring delight to your face no matter what. So in Africa we partner with several orphanages. One of them is in Uganda and it was started by a boy who was a street kid himself and started feeding kids and just collecting them and when we were there on our last trip we of course visited the school where they educate 350 students and they when the class let out and they heard they were there I was standing there with um, a board member, our treasurer, and those kids rushed at us and almost knocked Aww. us over. They're so adorable. And um, my nails had grown really long because I'd been overseas for so long. And they were like kind of scared of me at first. And they were like, ooh, and they were pointing at my hands. And I said, no, 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 give me your arm. I said, it's so that you can go like this. Oh. And so then they, now you got to go wash that. <laughs> with soap and water but that they said that's I said this is so I can scratch your back and tickle you and so then 300 kids lined up in a row and I had to go down the line giving everybody <laughs> a back rub and tickling their back but we went and visited the girls dorm and the boys dorm and the girls dorm is in town near the school so that they can walk to school and we were leaving and I noticed that there there are 50 girls that live there and I noticed that there were um, only 16 beds, mm -hmm. mattresses. Mm -hmm. And I said, Patrick, why do you have 16 mattresses? He said, we only have enough money for 16 beds. The girls lay on them in a row together. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me about that. He said, well, last month, he said they had a child die of malaria. And I know I grew up in Asia and we had to take malaria pills every week. I know how preventable that is. Mm -hmm. And I just immediately got my purse out. I carry a little extra money with me. And this is why. And I immediately paid for mattresses for all those girls mm -hmm. and treated malaria mosquito nets because yes. that is something that never has to happen. And so then we were leaving and I saw a sewing machine in the corner. And you know, we have sewing academies around the world. And I said, oh, Patrick, do you sew? Do your girls sew? And he said, oh, Mrs. McDonald, he said, this poor guy, he said, have you ever tried supplying feminine hygiene products for 50 teenagers a month? And I thought, oh boy. He said, we make disposable or reusable ones. And so it was just so fascinating to me because we do that in India as well. Mm -hmm. And it was just one more example of how they're careful. But then we went to the best part of it all. We went to where the boys live. They live outside of town. They had this property that he got. And um, they, when they first went there, they were kind of there was, there was a local doctor, they call a witch doctor, but there was a local um, shaman who people went to when they were sick or something. And she didn't like it that they had come. And so they started doing, this is, they're a faith-based organization. They started doing prayer walks around that village. And she, and then they started meeting in homes. And she came to them and said, why aren't you meeting in my home? So they started a meeting in her home, and she joined the church, burned all her paraphernalia outside there, and we were standing outside this beautiful church building on their property, like a, more than a church, it's just like a fellowship hall where they have events and games, and it's big and it can hold like 500 people, and he was telling me the story of how that had been built and he said you know before when we moved here children were disappearing from our village a lot mm -hmm. and I said what do you mean disappearing he said well in their particular setting he said when a business person in the capital city wants to start a business they will go to the local shaman and they will say we need you to tell us what to do to guarantee financial success mm -hmm. and the shaman will say to them well, you need to find a child with a full head of hair and kidnap them 
and bury their head in your foundation mm -hmm. and you will be as successful as the number of hair on their head. Well, that just, you know, devastated me and my board member because he was so happy that there were only a few kids disappearing, not a lot. And we're like, one is too many. <laughs> but um, so we were talking to him about that and just trying to understand, you know, what we could do. While we're standing there, we look over and we see this. I don't know what you want to call it, thing that's made out of like metal and wire and wood. And I said, what's that? And he goes, oh, those are our pigs. So we walk over there and there's three pigs in there that are going to have multiple piglets, I guess. And so it just starts multiplying. And all three sows are pregnant and they're due to have babies any day. And he's explaining to us how it works. And lo and behold, my board member who's with me is, grew up on a pig farm. Didn't you tell me you grew up on a pig farm? I didn't grow up on a pig farm, but I did grow up um we did have pigs on our farm. Well, did you learn what happens when a mother pig has her babies? I did, yes. What happens? So when she rolls over, there's a danger of her suffocating her piglets. By accident. By accident. Well, lo and behold, my board member knew all of that. And she's like, Patrick, these pigs can't have babies in here. And he's like, well, we make the orphan boys take them out every 20 minutes. And she's like, this is going to exponentially grow. Like a year from now, you're not going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have chores, but this is going to be like a full-time job if you try and keep these piglets from getting rolled over on. So she's explaining to him how you have a wall that you lift. And I, bleh, I don't know anything <laughs> about piggeries. And so Phil and I are in a corner. My husband and I are in a corner. And we're like you know, surreptitiously counting our money, going, and Phil's like, we've got to do something, Beck. And pigs sell, they, uh, in that country, they have a high profit margin. And Patrick, bless his heart, he knows he can feed his orphans, he can sell it and buy other produce, and we'd walk by all the produce. And each little um, orphan boy for a chore, when they're not in school, they get their own little plot and they get to decide what they grow and all of that. And so Phil and I are counting our money in a corner going, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And when we got in the car to drive back to town, the three of us, the treasurer, me and Phil were sitting in the back and Patrick and the driver were in the front and they were talking Lugandan and we were going, we need to count our money. <laughs> and so Laura was opening her purse, Phil was opening his tummy pack, I was, and you know what, I had done a quick budget of everything that I heard them talking about and I added a hundred dollars in for miscellaneous because these projects you know you think it's going to be 2,000 it ends up being 2,400 or something and do you know we had the money to a penny minus the hundred dollars so I stuck it in an envelope and just handed it to him. But it was just so much fun and of course Africa is the land of lions and this does not come from Africa, but this little guy is alpaca, and he is so incredibly soft and wonderful. And you can go to listening to one of our Breaking Chains that's stories with Dr. Phil, mm -hmm. and he's telling a story of when he was stalked by a real lion. But anyway, so those, that's one of my favorite um, stories there. Yeah. There's it's another program further south, way south in Africa, to the very bottom of Africa, mm -hmm. in South Africa. And when we were there, um, it's the only program, we have over 400 program requests of people that want to partner with Women at Risk. But this is a program that I pursued them because I read about them in a magazine. And what they do is they rescue babies born HIV positive who are thrown away and they might be found on the side of the road in a, you know, an athletic bag or something. And they take these babies in and they collect breast milk from healthy, African moms and they freeze it 
and they give it to them for the first year of life that gives them that antibiotic kick in the pants because these are women who have immunities right. to what's happening there and then they get them adopted into African homes and while I was there there was this little boy that was rescued he was not HIV positive but he had been kidnapped because he had the right blood type and he had been put in a freezer so that they could use his organs in the black market of organ donors which is called the red market and so people who need an organ donation and um, are willing to pay for it illegally that is how this industry has um, come to be and so he was rescued in time he has a freezer burn on his face but he was adopted into a wonderful African family and he has siblings and so it has a happy ending you know in this industry there's just so many sad stories but there are so many incredibly powerful stories with hopeful endings and so our passion is to tell you stories that have hope and are filled with um, that story because really what we do works. It's not rocket science. It's just being a safe place and wrapping arms of love around wounded people. Another program in that same country creates jewelry too. And we have two pieces that we're featuring as well from South Africa. And these are fun because they're kind of funky, they're kind of industrial, and they have a lava stone in the middle. And lava stones are unique in that if you put essential oil or you even just spray your perfume, mm -hmm. it actually absorbs it and diffuses it throughout the day. Or you can just leave it as is. But these are two, a, a bracelet and a necklace. And, you know, my daughter wouldn't wear them together because they don't believe in matchy-matchy. But my generation, you got to give me both. Or I'm not buying it because I don't want to have to think about it. But those are just beautiful pieces of jewelry, also from South Africa. And it was just an incredible place to learn more about Africa, a whole different side of Africa, and precious partners who are... Um, locally there just working with children and HIV positive kids and HIV um, training and rescue and jewelry making and giving people ways to make a living with dignity and just learning about the Zulu tribe and other tribes there and it was just a privilege to be in that part of the world and I loved it because it reminded me surprisingly of where I grew up it's tropical. It's very different from the rest of Africa. And so okay. it was just very fun place to be. And the ocean was there and there was a lot of tropical trees. And it felt very different from what you think of as Sahara. Mm -hmm. And so it was just um, a very diverse culture. A lot of Indians there and Dutch and African tribes and just a country rich, rich with culture and history and beauty. Thank you so much, Becky, for sharing your heart for Africa with us. And thank you for joining us today on Breaking Chains. Go ahead and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Share our video and remember to comment below on Facebook that you shared it to be entered in this week's giveaway. From our house to yours, this means war.